What is the most common non-communicable infectious disease in the world? You know, at cocktail parties, when people ask me, what do I do for a living? My answer always leaves them puzzled. What is an endodontist, they say? An endodontist is someone or a dentist who specializes in the prevention and treatment of diseases of pulpal origin, which leads to the next question as to what is the pulp? The dental pulp is a tiny bit of tissue inside your root that is trapped during the formation of the root. It's something as small as a half of a drop of water in volume, and it contains a neurovascular bundle that comes from the head and goes into your teeth and gives it a little bit of sensation. And this is a very pristine and very clean environment, but when it does get infected with microbes, you end up having inflammation that can lead into infection and an abscess as a consequence of not treating it. The endodontists, therefore, are toothache specialists. And over the years and over the past century, we have developed a series of techniques and technology to address this problem associated with the infection in our teeth, and that's called root canal therapy. And it's a very intricate procedure, very precise, in which we clean and disinfect and fill this root canal space. But today, I don't want to talk to you about what my company has done to develop all of these techniques and technology for doing this procedure. But instead, I want to talk to you why are there 15 million root canals done on an annual basis in North America and how they can be avoided. And that's an even more noble goal. So let's talk about that. And the answer to that is the answer to the first question I asked. Dental caries are the most common non-communicable infectious disease in the world. And they're infectious because they are caused by microbes, and these microbes are a normal inhabitants of our oral cavity. You know, we have about 770 different species of bacteria in our oral cavity. Only a handful of these cause disease and dental cavities. And the reason that they do is one tiny little molecule in the environment that activates these things. And that molecule is sucrose, which is a carbohydrate, and it contains a fructose and a glucose. And these uh, bacteria take the fructose and stick to the teeth, and they take the glucose to start to ferment and create acid that then penetrates the impervious enamel outer shell of our teeth that protects our teeth. And then you may say, well, where can I get the sucrose and how can I avoid it? And the answer to that is the fifth largest commodity in the world, and that is sugar. So the table sugar is the cause of this problem. And the reality of it is that these handful of microbes that are in the oral cavity are normal inhabitants. They are not pathological. It's only the presence of sucrose that activates them and causes a problem. So in 95% of cavities and dental caries, this could have completely been avoided if we had absolutely no sugar in our diets. And that deserves its own little history because the history of sugar follows the history of humanity. A couple of hundred thousand years ago, when we lived in the savanna and left Africa, our ancestors were used to a diet that was primarily uh, full of legumes and fresh foods and, and vegetables and so on, and fruits as well, which has a different type of uh, sugar. It's not a sucrose. And as a result, of that, we did not have dental caries to a significant extent, and it was not a problem. But it wasn't really until much later, as we spread around the world, people in Indonesia and Papua New Guinea discovered a plant that was indigenous in the area called sugarcane that had a, the juice had a certain sweetness to it. And that resulted into the sugarcane juice. And then it wasn't until the sugarcane juice was exported to India, where a couple of thousand years ago in India, a technique for evaporating the liquid and then leaving the crystalline sugar behind was developed and uh, that allowed sugar to be a tradable commodity because solid sugar now that could be taken to different parts of the world. And so at that time, the Persians and the Arabs took the sugar cane from India and those areas in China and those areas all the way back to the Middle East. And it wasn't really until the Crusades where the Europeans got access to the sugar cane from the Arabs during the Crusade Wars. And uh, that sugarcane was then developed in the Mediterranean area, and it resulted into the sugar, which was at that time a luxury item, and it was only sold to the rich because it, the yield was very low. And as a result of this, dental caries became a problem of the rich. And what's interesting is some of the atrocities of its time the poor used to sell their teeth to the rich, remove their perfectly good teeth out of the poor people's mouth, and then cut off the roots and put them into dentures, since there were no synthetic materials at that time, and the rich could use those teeth. And when you think that things are not going to get worse, well, we know what happened once the new lands were discovered by Columbus. And he, on his second trip, brought sugarcane to Hispaniola and those areas and found that it could be very well cultivated. And that resulted into the agriculture 
agriculture by the Portuguese and the Hispanics, the agriculture of sugarcane in Central America and in South America that resulted into the slave trade and triangular trade that brought the slaves to do work in the field and the sugar was created that then resulted into, uh, was fermented into rum that was sold to Europe and the Europeans then exchanged some textiles and other things with the slave traders in Africa. And that is obviously a dark part of our history. And when we thought that things are just as bad as they get, all of a sudden came Edward Howard, an inventor in England, who developed a technique under vacuum and low temperature to extract even more purified sugar out of sugarcane juice. And that allowed to a very high yield of pure sugar and what we know as white sugar now to be available to all masses. That democratized sugar to everyone. And all of a sudden, the problem that used to be a problem of the rich became a problem of everyone, including the poor. And what's interesting, and most people don't realize this, is that within a few years, the seventh cause of death in London was tooth decay. And the reason for that is because there was cheap sugar, everybody was getting dental caries, but there was no dentistry and there was no antibiotics. So people were getting dental abscesses and infections and they were dying as a result of it. As you might wonder, why is it that sugar has such an effect on our uh, body and we seek it so badly that we're willing to die for it? And the reason for that, as I mentioned, our ancestors in the savanna had developed from an uh, evolutionary biology point of view this module in our brain that had a drive to seek sweetness and that was our dopamine reward center. From a time of scarcity, all of a sudden we had moved to a time of abundance and we could not control our sweet tooth uh, and ended up having all kinds of problems with it. And where else do we see this problem? With other products of other plants, such as the poppy flower resulting into opium that is then purified by humans to result into heroin, a white powder that causes significant addiction and, and, and also triggers the dopamine reward center. Also, we all know about the cocoa plant and the associated cocaine that does also affect the dopamine reward center. And we're all familiar with the white powder that is the extract of the tobacco plant, which is the nicotine that is produced and put into the cigarettes. And that has been the cause of a major health problem in the past century in terms of cancer and all the associated diseases with the consumption of cigarette tobacco and a consequence of nicotine addiction. And we have now the same thing we've had historically, even much earlier than any of these other white powders, the white powder that is the crystalline extract of the sugar cane resulting into purified sugar and then causing this new addiction that we have, which is completely legal and causes all kinds of health consequences around the world and in our own communities from the developed world into the developing world and especially to our children. And you may wonder then why is it that we're not doing anything about that? And it's essentially a page right out of the tobacco industry. The sugar industry has had strong lobbies in the Congress and around the world and trying to, based on these new documents that have been revealed and published in the Journal of American Medical Association, the sugar industry did everything they could to collude and kind of prevent the knowledge of the problems associated with sugar to be hidden and not to come out. And in the 1970s and the 80s, the sugar industry convinced the FDA to point the finger at fat as the cause of cardiovascular disease and problems instead of sugar. And we all now know, based on these recent documents, the collusion that went in there and the reality being that fat was not the problem that it was meant to be, rather sugar was the problem. And this inverted pyramid of food and diet resulted into the obesity crisis that we're all facing today and the sugar addiction that all of us, including our children, are suffering from. Of course, sugar substitutes are a great solution to that, especially with the oral cavity. So that's an important thing since these microbes cannot metabolize that. But we're not going to get into that. And this also being a TED conference, I'd like to just quickly say that there are a lot of different advances in the future in terms of technology for addressing uh, dental caries and being able to pick it up earlier than, than before in terms of using laser fluorescence as a method of detecting caries early or using different types of AI technology to pick up pattern recognition on the x-rays and uh, uh, be able to pick up decay and decalcification, demineralization earlier. The entire effort is going into preventing the original demineralization as the first effort to prevent dental caries from finding access to the structures below 
the enamel. And then also it carries vaccines since these things are microbially based have been also a promise over the past few years. But I spoke to the foremost researcher in this area, Dr. Daniel Smith, who said the unfortunate unrolling of the coronavirus vaccine and the lack of popularity and public reaction to it has been very disheartening to them. So they're not sure if this is even worth uh, moving and getting into, which is really a pity. But I think the theme here, as I want to keep on emphasizing, is the idea of prevention is really the only solution for us in this field of dentistry and endodontics and all of the associated problems we see in the oral cavity to to be addressed because 95% of all caries are preventable if we can cut down the uh, sugar in our, the sucrose actually in our diet. Granted, to some extent, we do get some of these microbes associated with caries, especially from our mother's side, that's we, they inoculate our oral cavity. But the reality of the matter is that if we don't feed these microbes sugar, they do not cause any problems. Always the sugar. And the problem is that today, 80% of the products you find on the supermarket shelves have had added sugar. And the added sugar is the manufacturer's trick to hijack our brain because they know we have this reward system in our brain, the dopamine reward system, and we subconsciously gravitate to sweetness. They add sugar to things that don't even need sugar. So we need to be better at reading labels and prevent and avoid this added sugar problem. Try to restrict your dietary intake of sucrose to uh, uh, and sugar as a whole to less than 10% and ideally less than 5% of your total caloric values. But most importantly, because most of the problems occur in the very early childhood and from the age of 12 to 24, most of us get these caries. And because the restorations that we have in dentistry don't have a lifespan that is too long because the oral environment is very hostile and uh, they can't survive. So you end up getting into this conveyor belt early on with dentistry and things get larger and larger as we get older. And the only way we can avoid expensive and problematic dentistry down the line is to avoid that first caries as a child. So we need to start very early and that's really the solution. And my solution to all of this is, you know, uh, with the Halloween, we take our kids to uh, door to door and they get candy. We wouldn't even think about taking our kids door to door to gather booze and cigarettes from strangers. And the reason for that is because we've made that uncool, but somehow sugar is still normalized. And what we need to do is we need to make sugar uncool. The same kind of a campaign we did as an industry to cigarette and tobacco, we need to do the same thing with sugar. And the solution that I propose as a call to action would be to tax the sugar at the import level when it's raw before manufacturers fall, uh, find all kinds of names, different names and tips and tricks to add it to, the, to our uh, food tax it raw, use that money only to educate in the early education centers about the problems associated with sugar so that in a voluntary basis, kids would not be gravitating towards sugar. And we should also be more responsible as parents to avoid that. The only solution we have to make this most prevalent and yet most preventable, non-communicable infectious disease in the world.